Hello, and welcome to the forum. Every week, we take no more than 15 minutes to discuss the three highest conviction ideas surfaced across the Smart Karma network, cutting through the noise and helping you zero in on what truly matters most. The live forum and Q&A session are exclusively available to Smart Karma Plus subscribers. You can always revisit previous episodes on this YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into this week's ideas. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Smart Karma Weekly Forum. The forum is a high impact live webinar that's exclusive to Smart Karma Plus subscribers. We use this to discuss some of the best, highest conviction insights surfaced across the network. The forum is meant purely for informational purposes and does not constitute investment advice. It is the opinion not of Smart Karma, but that of our insight providers. And lastly, chat of house rule applies. Please do not share um, any of the material um, that's shown to you today on a public forum without prior permission. Every week, we try and present three ideas to you. These are generally a, a small cap company, a larger or a mega cap company, and then finally a theme that um, we think is very relevant and is also trending across the network. At the end of the week, we take recordings of the forum and we upload them to our YouTube channel. This allows you to revisit past forums and or also catch up on the session in case you missed it live. This is also a format which is easy for you to share with your friends and get their thoughts on the topics discussed as well. In this week's forum, we will look at the Thaibev beer company IPO. As you will recall, this is not the first time the company is looking to do this spin-off and listing. Secondly, we will look at Moderna. We will revisit one of the hottest, most favorite stocks from the COVID time and how it looks today. And lastly, we will look at uh, a top-down view on whether Asia X of China can remain resilient from an economic standpoint and also to a small extent from a markets standpoint. At any given point of time during the forum, you can ask questions using the Q&A button. The forum typically lasts only about 10 minutes. We like to keep it short and sweet. Um, you can always post questions later on on the platform and analysts will come back to you with their responses. Let's kick off with Thai Beverage. The ticker is THBEV. This is Singapore listed. The market cap is 13 billion US dollars. So this is very much in the large cap category. There are several analysts who cover ThaiBev on the platform, and today we will feature an insight from Sumit Singh, who looks, who looks very closely at the peers of ThaiBev's beer business, and also on the, on the valuation of the upcoming listing. So first things, um, for those of you who might not be aware, ThaiBev is actually a company that's focused heavily on the Thai market, they provide a range of branded beers as well as spirits, which they sell in Thailand. Um, on the 5th of May, Thaibev officially announced that the beer business will be spun off and they're looking to raise just shy of a billion US dollars. Um, now, we compared Thaibev in this insight with some of the other beer companies uh, that are listed in Asia. Uh, the, the Thai Bev beer company would probably be the smallest of the listed peers in terms of total volume sold. But conversely, it has probably the highest average selling price compared to the other firms that are listed. What are these firms? You know, we can look at Sabico, which is Vietnam. We can look at San Miguel, uh, China Resources Beer, which is China-based, Qingtao, which is also China-based, Budweiser APAC, which is now listed in Hong Kong, as well as United Breweries. Um, now, uh, because of these high average selling prices, Thaibev's beer company already has the highest margins amongst the beer company. Um, this, you know, we look at multiples like EBITDA, gross profit, as well as fat meat to come up with that. And you can see that on the right hand side as well. Um, we're looking at an implied market cap getting close to 4 billion US dollars before factoring in the proceeds from the IPO. If you go and spend time reading Sumit's note, I think he goes on to um, note 
that because Tybev's margins on the beer side are already so high, the potential for them to expand further is fairly limited. And secondly, you know, growth has been very anemic, not just during the COVID period, but even in the years prior. So we would look forward to hearing plans from the company on how they plan to grow the business um, or are the use of proceeds from this IPO going to go into primarily reducing debt at the parent level? So good questions for management and an independent perspective on this Singapore listing. Moving on to uh, Moderna. Moderna is uh, mRNA US, it's US listed. The market cap is about 54 billion US dollars. Um, it trades almost a billion dollars a day. As you can see from the share price chart, this was um, trading almost close to $500 at one point of time last year. Um, and now it has fallen all the way down to about $130. So it's fallen quite a lot. Actually, it's fallen pretty much in line with um, the healthcare stocks in the US market. The analyst who covers global healthcare on Smart Karma is Tina Banerjee. She used to work at William O'Neill and uh, she is a specialist in this area. So again, by now Moderna is a name that you would have all heard of, but in case you've not, Moderna is a biotech company and um, they specialize in developing messenger RNA, which is mRNA therapeutics and vaccines. Um, most famously, they were one of the first few to come up with an mRNA vaccine for COVID and you know, several countries, including Singapore, for instance, have used that vaccine uh, to treat its citizens. Um, now, Moderna uh, actually released very, very strong results in the first quarter of this year. There was a slight concern that results might weaken, but as you can see from the chart on the right side, results were actually very strong. Um, they made nearly $6 billion of revenue in the quarter. Um, and, you know, both on the revenue side as well as on the profit side, they beat consensus expectations easily. They further provided guidance that at least for this year, they will reach nearly $21 billion of vaccine sales, uh, which is, and, uh, you know, given the gross margins that they have, uh, will translate into significant profitability and cash accumulation on the balance sheet. They also revealed that, uh, you know, outside of their COVID vaccine, they have managed to expand their pipeline to other areas. And, you know, they will be sharing more about these other product lines in coming quarters. They've got close to $19 billion out of their $54 billion market cap as cash. Um, they also announced a $3 billion share repurchase plan, and they're looking for M&A candidates. This is, this is now a really, really interesting stock because the bears will argue that its revenues and profits are about to fall off a cliff next year because demand for COVID vaccines will decline, which is true. That's very well known and I think quite well understood. But having said that, the amount of cash that they have accumulated and given the um, sell-off in healthcare companies, share prices everywhere, uh, puts them in, in a pretty enviable position because they can embark on some really interesting m and They can also buy back a lot of their stock, which provides some downside cushion. And they can um, certainly develop new product lines. So for growth investors who are looking at the biotech and healthcare space, um, you know, Moderna on the sell-off starts to look interesting. Moving on to the third and final idea for discussion today. Uh, this is probably an extremely important theme uh, for all our audience in uh, South Southeast Asia. Um, we're, we're looking closely here at whether the economies in rest of Asia outside of China, can they continue to be resilient in the current market environment? Um, the analyst who focuses on regional economics for us is Manu Bhaskaran. 
Uh, Manu is a very, very senior and well-recognized name in Asian circles. Um, he's been a chief economist in uh, many banks. He's an advisor to most central banks in Asia. And I would strongly recommend that you follow his work on Smart Karma if, um, you know, top-down thinking and uh, economics are important for you. Okay, um, so first of all, if we look at latest economic data uh, and people look at things like manufacturing PMI, just to unpack that a little bit, PMI uh, is, is a series, it's a data series that governments collect and publish. These are based on surveys of manufacturers um, within that particular country. And it's a barometer for the health of you know, factories and manufacturing at large in a particular country. There is also a PMI for services, which reflects the outlook for companies that are not manufacturing goods, but rather delivering services. So if we look at the latest data from April, seven out of the 10 economies in Asia, it's Japan, they were continued to grow faster in April versus March, which shows that it, the economies are still in recovery mode and uh, business activity is picking up. In addition, you know, there has been a significant uptick in mobility trends for retail and recreational activity. Uh, most of these have now returned to pre-COVID levels in not all countries, but in most countries. In addition, we are seeing uh, and experiencing a rebound in travel and tourism. This is also coinciding with good foreign direct investment. Um, and lastly, also a revival in infrastructure projects which had been delayed or deferred during the COVID period. So all in all, based on the data that we are seeing at the moment, um, you know, things look reasonably okay. What are the risks? There's a couple of big risks that we're gonna take a look at. The first is, you know, China continues to maintain its dynamic zero COVID policy. That is a dampener on growth for the whole region and many other Asian countries depend on China for their growth. Uh, the positive on that side is that over the last few weeks, China has decidedly announced that they will backstop the economy. They will loosen restrictions, loosen policy. When I say restrictions, we're talking about monetary or fiscal restrictions, and they will allow the economy to rebound. Um, and that will be a strategic priority. Nonetheless, that is one of the risks. Secondly, a risk that is more, uh, uh, I guess, more pronounced in other countries is the risk of higher and more aggressive tightening by the central banks. Uh, why? We're starting to see inflation pick up in uh, many regions and many countries, and central banks will respond by raising interest rates to curb that inflationary pressure. Meanwhile, we think domestic demand and tourism will continue to uh, boost growth while labor market conditions will continue to pose as a headwind. You know, we are seeing huge restrictions in uh, labor uh, everywhere. So that's the outlook. Um, I think the resilience um, should remain so long as there is not a significant global shock. Um, central banks should be able to manage the trajectory. Of course, outside of these economic uh, activities, we also have to bear in mind geopolitical risk, which now stands at probably the highest levels we've seen in the last two decades. So it is a, um, it is a pretty sanguine outlook at the moment. And it's something that we will be discussing more regularly in upcoming forums with you. If there are any uh, questions that come to mind, now would be the time to ask. Uh, otherwise, as I mentioned, the platform is available for you to post your discussions and questions. You can even tag specific analysts if you want them to respond. And that's a great way for you to uh, build your connections with the best analysts directly on the platform. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap up today's forum and we we'll look forward to speaking to you next week. Take care, stay safe, speak soon. Bye-bye. That's it for this week. 
You can find more ideas like the ones we discussed today on demand on our YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe and hit the notification button. If you like these ideas, spread the word. Tell a fellow investor about Smart Karma Plus and follow us on social media. Just search for Smart Karma. And of course, don't forget to visit smartkarma.com for more independent, differentiated investment insights. Thanks for watching and see you next week.